This month, we have been looking at the prophetic duration. My hands are made stronger by diligence. Let's shout it out loud. My hands are made stronger by diligence. And for our Sunday services, we have been looking at the blessedness of a diligent hand. The blessedness of a diligent hand. And this morning, we'll be looking at part four of it. There are two anchor or foundation scriptures that we'll be looking at. The first is Joel chapter 2 and verse 28. Joel chapter 2 verse 28 and Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all, all, all flesh, all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see vision. Uh, we have interpreted this scripture in, wrongly in the past. But this morning the Holy Ghost will be showing us what does it mean that he has put it on all flesh. What does it mean that the old men, is it old men? Who is an old man? Is it somebody that is 80, 90 years shall be dreaming dreams? And uh, young men shall be seeing vision. We will attempt to look at the, 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 the meaning behind these words. And Proverbs 29 verse 18, uh, in the message translation, it says, If my people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. But when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. They are most blessed, not more blessed. They are most blessed when they attend to what he reveals. Now, back to Joel chapter 2 verse 28. The Bible says afterwards. What does that afterward mean? In the last days. So right now, we are in the last of the last of the days. Why? In Acts chapter 2 verse 1. That scripture was fulfilled. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was come, there came a sound from heaven like as of a mighty rushing wind and a cloven tongue of fire and sat on each of them. So from the day of Pentecost up until now, the scripture has been fulfilled. So we're in the last of the last of the last of the days. Praise the Lord. Now also that scripture says, the spirit will be poured on all flesh. I was pondering this word and I was saying, Holy Ghost, do you mean all flesh? He said all flesh. All humanity. All humanity. But there are two categories. The first category is the called. Those of who belong to all flesh who have been called and who have responded to that call. So the spirit of the Lord has been poured out on all flesh. All flesh. Including the man on drugs that is sitting at the corner of the street. Including the one that is currently a harlot. Including that one that is debased and doesn't understand and doesn't know his identity. The spirit has been poured out on all flesh. All flesh. However, some have responded to the call. There is the call, but not responded yet. So all flesh, all flesh means those who have been called and have responded, and those who have been called but are yet to respond. That's why today, if a drug addict understands the calling of God upon his life, he can become the greatest evangelist that ever can be. Why? Because the Spirit has been poured out on all flesh. Praise the Lord. Now, it said also in that scripture, my sons and daughters shall prophesy. What does that mean? That is the called who have responded. The sons and daughters, those who have been called. So you have been called, you have responded. The Bible says that you are a son and if you are a, 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 a female, you are the daughter and what is your portion to prophesy, to stand in the prophetic and begin to declare. Also in that scripture we say, it says, old men shall dream dreams. Who are the old people? They are not people who are old in age. He's talking about the elders. 
You remember in James chapter 5 verse 14, it says, is any sick, let him call for the elders. So there are elders in this kingdom. Elders is not by age, sir. It's not by age. No, it's not by age. It's not because I'm, I'm 40 now, so I've become an elder. No, it's by maturity of your spiritual senses. It's by what? Maturity of your spiritual senses. The Bible called them those who by reason of their senses, they have understood the place. So a man and a woman or a boy or a girl who understands his place in the kingdom and has the right authority is an elder in this kingdom. It's an elder. So it's not by age. So elders shall do what? Shall dream dreams. And young men, who are young men, those who in their spirit man, they can see, they are ready because God accepts, calls everyone into sonship, both the male and the female. He calls him, he said, everyone whom he calls, he calls them to son. We are all born as children, but we grow into sonship. By reason of our understanding of the scripture and understanding of the Lord. So those are the people, it says, they what will happen to them, they shall see visions. In other words, there will be people who, by reason of their encounter with the world, are able to see and gaze and look ahead and begin to take territories. That's what God is going to do of you in this service. I didn't hear someone's amen. That is what God is going to be doing of you in this service. If you are the one I'm talking about, let me hear your loud amen. amen. Say your young men shall see visions. That is the youthful in her at heart. That you are young is a matter of the heart. It's not the reason of age. No, it's not by age. It's at heart. People who have, who can gaze or have mental perception. The word described there as vision means to gaze and to do what to have mental perception praise god now please understand dreams that are revelations dreams that are revelations are of god now let me try and analyze so dream dreams and see vision dream dreams and see visions dreams are of god it is god who shows a dream to a man of the great things that he wants to do. Now, it's a young man who goes into the world and says, I understand from the scripture and begin to catch a revelation based on the word of God of what God intends to do. Now, in this service, by reason of an impartation, your, your perception of the word of God, your perception of life, your perception of what God wants to do will begin to change. Amen somebody's perception is changing in this service. If you are that person, let me hear your loud amen. Now, visions, I realize, are mostly mental perception. Mental perception. Now, the biggest imprisonment in life that I've found is a man whose mind is closed and does not see beyond where he is. And as a matter of fact, that's the worst kind of blindness that anyone can have. Is to be alive with your eyes open, but you cannot see beyond yourself. You cannot understand scripture to know exactly what direction the Lord is leading you. It's the worst kind of blindness. I have good news for someone. That blindness shall be cured in this service. I didn't hear your loud amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the anchor scripture in Proverbs 29, 18 says something very important. In King James Version, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people do what? Perish. King James, let's look at what it says. It says, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And the message translation says, if people can't see what God is doing. If people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves, but when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. In other words, what brings the most blessing for a man is what he can see of what the Lord is showing. 
Do you realize that there is a frequency that never shuts down, that is always revealing, always speaking, always revealing, always transmitting, always revealing and showing things. Now, your ability to rise up to that level, to catch the vision of, of what God is showing is what distinguishes you on this earth. He said they are most blessed when they attend to what he reveals. So this morning, grace and impartation for attention to what God is revealing shall be given to someone. Amen. If you are that person, let me hear you loud. Amen. amen. Lift up your right hand and say, I believe and I receive it. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Now I found out that the blessing of the Lord commits victories into our hands. Just like the scripture says. It is the blessing of the Lord that gives you and I the ability to have victory. It is the blessing of the Lord that we can glean, that we can hold on to, that brings victories your way and my way. In Psalm 144, verse 1, the Bible says, Blessed be the Lord my strength, which teacheth my hands to war and my fingers to fight. So God teaches your hand to war and your finger to fight. What does that mean? It means that it is the idea that the Lord reveals to you, the things that he shows to you that makes your hand go to work and begin to do exploit. I decree over someone in this service, God will call this an impartation service. We impart you with grace from on high in the name of Jesus that will make your hands go to war and your fingers begin to fight. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Deuteronomy chapter 28 verse 12. It said the Lord opened unto thee his good treasure. The heaven to give the rain, give the rain unto thy land in his season. And to bless all the work of your what? All the work of your hand. And thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. By reason of an impartation this morning, the blessing of the Lord will come upon that work of your hand. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the blessing of the Lord will come upon the work of your hand. In the name of Jesus. So he says, and to bless all the work of thy hand, and thou shalt lend unto many nations, and thou shalt not borrow. So it is what God imparts parts upon you that cause you to go out and begin to do exploits and begins to begin to take territories and begin to to win and win again somebody is living here winning yeah. i didn't hear you loud amen yeah. now i found something in scripture in deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 24 it said rise ye up take your journey Pass over the river Anon and behold. Say behold. behold. The word behold means see. See. I have given into thy hand Sion, the Amorite, king of Heshbon and his land. Begin to possess it and contend with him in battle. When this scripture hit me, the first question I asked myself is, do you possess a thing and then begin to contend? Or what do you do when you want to go and take a possession? What do you first do? You contend first and then you take and you possess. But God says no. He said first, see it. Once you see it, what do you do? Possess it. And then contend. In case anyone rises that will rise against you in that issue, then contend. Now, What's that telling us? Brethren, your ability to possess things, 
depends on how far you can see. How far you can see in scripture, in life, determines what comes to you. You are traveling on a road, and as you're traveling, your light is not very bright. What kind of speed will you maintain? What do we do? You slow down. But if your lights are bright as daylight, and you can see five kilometers ahead, then you can do the maximum speed. And I know some of you, you do over speed. <laughs> so, how far, how fast you travel in life is dependent on how well you can see. It, it depends on how deep you can understand and how connected you are to the most high. It depends on what your spirit man is perceiving of what God is saying. It depends on your faith. So God said, see it, possess it, and contend. So what it means is, it is not by labor. It is not what? It is not by labor. It is by faith. It is by perception. It is by what you understand of the word. And this morning, whoever is here that does not have an understanding of what God is saying, I decree via this impartation, an understanding shall come upon you. That you make will make you go from here and begin to possess. In the name of Jesus. So God said, begin to possess it. In other words, start to imagine it. Start to take it over. Once you can think it, then you can have it. Once it's here, then it will be here. That's what God will be doing this morning. An impartation will come upon you that will change your perception. That will cause you to begin to see what God is saying in his word. In the name of Jesus Christ. So please understand, it is what we see of what the Lord is showing that sets the pace for our diligence. Now, I'll give you a very simple illustration. A child is learning to crawl, and it's right there with mama in the front motivating the child, and it's dangling the thing, and he knows that baby loves that thing. The moment it comes to us, the baby wants to, I want to grab. So, what does mama do? Mama puts the thing in front of the baby and begins to dangle it. And the baby is crawling and it's making effort and it's moving and it's moving. Why? The perception. Oh, this is this thing that I love. And I begin to make effort. And as he's making effort, his legs are getting stronger. It's moving and gradually. How do we make children work? We have workers. We have a couple of things. You put it in the front and say, come, 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 come. Why? What are you trying to do? You are trying to make that child see exactly what's in it for him. And the moment he understands it, he begins to run after it. That's what God will be doing for us this morning. He will make us begin to see ahead. Your eyes will be open. Your spirit man will be quickened to begin to perceive from the word exactly what the Lord is saying. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the purpose of God in all of this is to facilitate our diligence. And he dangles before us and makes us see. So, it is what we see of what he is showing that determines how far we go. And this morning, someone will live here seeing. Someone will live here possessing. And someone will live here contending. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now, so if vision is so important, how do we realize our vision? How do we realize our vision? Now, I, was, I, 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 I wrote it down. I wrote this down. I said, every vision and dream with no strategy for realization will at best be a mirage. Do you know what a mirage is? You are traveling on a sunny afternoon. And far ahead, you can see the road. That same road you are traveling 
It's like there's water on it. Now, it's like water. And the closer you get, the more you realize that, oh, no, it's not water. It's like a mirage. Right? Now, what that means is this spread and listing. When you have a vision and you have a dream and you do nothing about it, it is like a mirage. It will only excite you, but it won't move you forward. But this morning, someone will be moving forward. So I have this here. How do we realize our visions and our dreams? And I read an article by a, a, a guy called Jeff Goins. What he did was he interviewed hundreds of people who were able to uh, understand and know people that have achieved their goals. People that had dreams and people who have realized their dream, they are right now in their dreams. And this over a hundred of people that he interviewed, he came up with three summaries, which I would like to share with you. Three lessons. Lesson number one about your vision and your dream, it says don't wait for clarity. Don't do what? Wait for clarity. Some will say, oh, no, no, I don't understand how it is. I know I can do it, but you see, I'm afraid. Now, here's what it says. It said, the problem, though, is we don't often know what we should be doing until we start doing it. It said, experience leads to competence. Competence creates confidence. We all want clarity before we are willing to take action. But more often than not, clarity comes with action. Say it out loud. Clarity comes with what? Action. I've been waiting. Lord, what do you want me to do? I don't know. He says, start. Do what? Do something. Don't wait until it is clear. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, first. 13. He said, now we know in part. Then we shall know in full. Now we can see it like through a glass. It's not very clear. Now the vision of your life that God is showing, you will not be able to get 100% clarity from day one. So, what do you do? You step out in faith. Believe the word. Take the word. When you walk and wait for clarity, what you're doing is you want to walk by sight. It is by faith, not by sight. It is by faith, not by sight. You say, Lord, I believe what you have said in your word. So I take steps. That's what he was he's saying. And Joyce Mayer said this. I love it a lot. He said, you say, oh, I can do it. I know I have the ability to do it, but I'm afraid. Then she said, do it afraid. Do it what? Afraid. In other words, step out. Look, the, the, the odds are in favor of those who take action. Those who are able to take step. Those who are able to step out. Until you take action, nothing happens. Your dreams remain a mirage. And I decree this morning that there is an impartation that is coming upon you that will steer you up from the inside out in the name of Jesus Christ. Lesson number two. He said, just because it's hard doesn't mean you should quit. Say it to your neighbor. Just because it's hard doesn't mean you should quit. Now, he said, you may like the idea of being a writer. Or the image of a construction project. But you haven't done any actual work. You don't understand the cost of the dream. Instead of putting yourself out there and risking failure. Don't be afraid to fail. You know what the Bible says? The righteous man falleth seven times. God raises him up again. So in your attempt to realize the vision. Take a risk. Say God. I bet on your word. I stand on your word. And I step out by faith. And as you take that giant step, no, he doesn't allow you to fall. Even if you fall, he's ready to bring you back up. Because that fall, that fall is an experience. Thomas Edison, they asked him, the man who tried to invent the light bulb, he tried it 1,900, 1,000 times, sorry. 
a thousand times before he got it to get the light bulb. And they asked him, after all the experience, what do you learn? He said, ah, I tried 999 times. Those 999 times shows me the ways that it could not work. That one way that it worked, he, he, it, it took 999 experiences. And do you know what he learned all through that 999 experiences? What the ways that it could not work. So he saw failure as propelling him into his future. Don't be afraid to fail. Don't be what? Afraid to fail. It's an experience. Failure is not a destination. No, it is just an experience. So don't define yourself. You did a business. You put your hand on it. You tried in that profession and in that career. You say, I don't know, it's too hard. And I, I just give up. I shared with us the testimony of a friend. When we were writing our chartered accountant exams together, he kept failing. He kept failing. And I asked him one day, I said, friend, I said, I hope you're not tired. He said, no. He said, unless the institute decides to close. <laughs> of course, the institute did not close. He passed. Praise God. The next time you try it, you're passing. Amen. The next time you try it, it's success. Amen. It's open door for you in the name of Jesus. And here's what they take away from that is. It says, you become what you practice. You what? You become what you practice. Lesson three. It said, commit, but be prepared to pivot. Commit, but what? Be prepared to pivot. What does that mean? It says, you say you are waiting for the right opportunity. Let's be honest. What you are doing is stalling. In other words, you are just, you are just in one point. It said, when you stay stuck in that job, you hate without making any movement towards change when you keep thinking about doing something but never follow through on it you are wasting an important part of your life he said and that's a shame he said because what you need to do is not that hard you just need to keep moving so i propose an alternative of compromise between doing nothing and picking the wrong dream and it says, make a seasonal commitment. Say your, to your neighbor, make a seasonal commitment. Yes. Choose something that strikes your fancy based on the possibility that it could be your dream. In other words, experiment. Not in a flaky, non-committal way. Pick something, commit to it for a season, call it a seasonal dream. If you want, iterate. In other words, repeat it until you reach a point where you know that this is what you should do or not do. He said, then go deeper and move on. This will give you experience, broaden your skill set, and teach you the value of commitment. That's lesson number three. In other words, take a dive. Go for it. Don't say, I'm waiting on God. God is waiting on you. Some will say, I've been waiting on God, I've been waiting on God, I've not heard God. God is waiting on you. Why? Because he already showed you a sign of what you should be doing. But you, you despised it. So what he's saying is, take that sign based on the word and take a step. And as you move, God begins to confirm and begins to give clarity as you go. And I decree from this service, an impartation is coming on someone here that will break that hold of fear upon your life. And we launch you out there in the name of Jesus. You are far bigger than where you are now. Please understand. You are far, far bigger than where you are now. What you are waiting for is waiting for you already. God is saying, get up my son. Get up my daughter. Take a step, begin to move forward. And I decree from this service, somebody will begin to move forward. In the name of Jesus. Now the next step, it says, there is one thing you can be sure of. You won't find your dream by standing still. It says you will have to work at it. It may at times even hurt a little, but it will be the good kind of hurt. Discovering what you were meant to do will require action 
we require reflection, and this is how awareness of our calling is grown, which is what will ultimately lead to the realization that this thing you are doing, this all-important something, just might be what you were born for. So, our realization is in our action. Our realization is in taking steps. Our realization is understanding what God is showing of his word and beginning to move in that direction. Somebody is moving in the direction of the will of God for his life. If you are that somebody, let me hear you loud. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to please make us understand and show us from scripture an example of where strategy was used to realize a vision. So, Vision without a strategy for realization remains a mirage. But I found this in, in the scripture. And I said here, every vision requires a strategy. It requires dressing up, showing up, dirty your hands. And then as you put your hands and begin to walk dirty, then the realization will come. And I see clearly an example of Moses and Sihon in Deuteronomy chapter 2 verse 24. When God told Moses, Moses, see, I have given unto you Sihon the Amorite and Hesh, the king of Heshbon. He said, begin to possess it and to contend with him in battle. What did Moses do? Immediately, Moses sent men. He sent men to Sihon. He said, Sihon, we are coming through your land. Are you going to allow us? And then all those stories. Please go back home and read clearly what it is in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 24. Now, long story short, though that strategy that Moses put in place, couldn't God who said, I have given you Sihon, just automatically just take the children of God, carry them, all of them, land them in Heshbon and give them the land? No, God couldn't do that. God is limited by your, your mind. It is your mind that limits God. So when that vision was shown, Moses stood up, put action in place, and sent men and said, Go, if we die, we die, but just go. Go and tell Heshbon. And then as they went, as they went, God backed them up. God stood by them. Listen, until you go in the direction that the Holy Ghost is showing you, that dream remains a mirage. But this service, there is an impartation coming upon you. In the name of Jesus. What about the man Joshua and Jericho? God told him, see, I have given to you Jericho. See, I have given to you what? Jericho. And what did they do? By the spirit of the Lord, Joshua thought, prayed. He saw a vision of how to take the land. Listen, God will never give you strategy. He will give you a vision. He will show you a dream. But he will require you to walk your mind and put strategy in place. He will require you to do what? Walk your mind. Tell your neighbor, walk your mind. He will require you to think. To take action. I have shown you where I'm taking you to. Rise up. Take your journey. Move forward. That was what Joshua did with Jericho. So when God showed him the vision of Jericho, how they were going to be taking it over, he set men in action and said, let's walk around the city. They did day one, day two. On day seven, they did it seven times. And the wall of Jericho came down flat. If they did nothing, they get nothing. Until you do something, you get nothing. You abide in the region of nothing until you do something. Praise the Lord. Now, the one I really want to share with us is about Nehemiah. Nehemiah and the walls of, and the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. All of that scripture you can find in the book of Nehemiah. So, it's homework. Please go back home and read up the book of Nehemiah. But there are just two aspects of what he did that I wanted to share with us. Now, what happened with Nehemiah? There was a vision. He heard that the walls of Jerusalem have been broken down. That is people, that the whole land was scattered. So from that thing that they heard, because 
our vision comes from what we hear. Our vision comes from what God is showing. You see, sometimes some things come around you. You hear it and you do nothing with it. God makes you to hear. And you heard it, but it just didn't make sense to you. I pray that in your day of visitation, you will not treat your dream like a story. Like someone just says something and just came casual. That in the day of your visitation, your spirit man will be active. So Nehemiah heard that his father's land, the gates have been broken. The walls have been destroyed. What did he do? He began to sob. And then the king saw him. And then the king said, what's happening to you, Nehemiah? He said, why would I not be sad? My father's land, you know, they dropped so much trouble. And then the king, the king favored him. It was in his action that the king's favor came. It was in Nehemiah's action that the favor of the king came. The favor of the king came upon him. He sent soldiers with him to go to the land. Now, Nehemiah mobilized the necessary persons, incubated the vision until the right time. God's, that which is God's time. Now, he used a prayer combat strategy to take over that land and rebuild the walls. In Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7 to 9, the Bible says, But it came to pass that when Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up, and the breaches began to be stopped. But then they were rough. And in verse 8, it said, And they conspired, all of them together, to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Now in verse 9, it said, Nevertheless, let's read this together. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. So, you heard something. You took step. And as you are going, because remember what God told Moses. Possess it and contain it. Now, listen, in your realization of that dream and vision, there will be contention. The fact that a contention comes does not mean that God is not in it. What God expects you to do is to wake up. That's what Nehemiah did. He said, we set a watch against them. What happened? They were building the wall. The enemies had. They came and began to tell themselves, even what they are building, if a fox go over, it will pull down. And they began to deride them and began to mess them up. In fact, there is a dangerous prayer that uh, Nehemiah prayed there. And I, I want us... You know, from time to time, it's in Nehemiah chapter 4. I think it's verse 4. He said, look, oh God, they have derided us. Look at them. They have messed us up. They are making, turn their own plan on their own head. And he said, they prayed, made their prayer unto God, but they set their watch against them. Most of the time, the only thing we do is, oh, I have prayed. Brother, what have you done? I have just prayed. No, it's not just prayer. Set up a watch. Do what? Set up a watch. That's why Jesus said, watch and pray. Not just pray and pray. Pray, watch. Pray, watch. How is the progress going? Is there any opposition? Is there anything that I need to do? And as you are praying, you are watching. God is speaking and showing you more things to do. That's what will happen to someone from this service. In the name of Jesus. In verse 15, it says, and it came to pass. When our enemies heard that it was known unto us and God had brought their counsel to north that we return all of us to the wall and everyone unto his work. Verse 16. He said, and it came to pass from that time forth that half of my servants were walking. The other half had spears and shields and the bows and the habigons and the rulers were behind them. Look at what they did. Half of the people were walking. Half carried guns. If you are an enemy, truly come here. So as they were walking, some, the soldiers were there. They were watching. They were waiting. So in your strategy, don't just pray, 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 pray. Set up a watch. Rise up. Take action. Move in the direction. Watch and then it, it, it determines the strategy of your prayer. So a prayer Combat strategy is what you need to realize the vision of your life. 
So wake up. Wake up. I found this also interesting. Verse 17. It said, they which builded on the wall and they that bear bodies with those that laid it, everyone with one hand walked and with the other hand held a weapon. So you are walking with one hand, the gun is in the other hand. I'm building, if you come here, I'm, I'm just clearing you out. Now what God expects us to do. At a point, half we are walking, half we are with guns. After it was, every man became that half. Half of one man walking, half of the other man carrying a gun. In your strategy, what it means is you need to set up a watch. You need to watch how far. How far am I going? With this way that I'm going, will I be able to get to this goal? What more do I need to do? What more prayer do I need to pray? Who else do I need to connect with? Who else do I need to talk to? That's the impartation that is coming upon someone in the service. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. With one hand they walked and with the other hand they carried the weapon. Don't put down your weapon. That's what many people do. They get blessed by God. They run out of church. They leave their weapon. And they just go walk, 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 walk. Where is your gun? When the enemy come, and that's why they become easy targets and easy prey. And it shoots them at the foot and they are gone. And they run back to church again to go and carry another weapon. And when God gives them the victory, they throw the weapon down and go again. But what God is asking you from this day forward to make your diligence perfect is to walk with one hand and carry your gun with another hand and stand there on your watch and begin to make progress. That is somebody's story in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, impartation. How is God going to impart us this morning? Please understand. Impartation means God using materials from the body of the anointed ones to convey his power. And I see many instances in scripture. Elisha and the mantle of Elijah. When Elisha, after Elijah was taken and Elisha caught the mantle, he got to River Jordan and said, where is the God of Elijah? And the mantle struck the river and the river said, if not for this mantle in your hand, I will not open up. So from the body of Elijah, the mantle of Elijah struck the river Jordan in the hands of Elisha and it worked. And I also saw Elisha in raising the dead son of the Shunammite woman. The Bible says, he first and foremost, he sent Gehazi. He said, take this rod and go. Ordinarily, he expected that rod to walk in the hand of Gehazi. But Gehazi, who was he? His heart was not right. So for a mantle to walk in your hand, your heart must be right with God. And then what did he do? Elisha himself got there, stretched his body. He didn't pray. Stretched his body over this young boy. And what happened? The boy sneezed and came back to life. Why? Because his body had power. Now we understand also Jesus in Mark chapter 6 verse 56, Matthew 9 21, at a point the Bible says they besought him and said, Jesus, please let us just, we don't want you to pray for us, don't touch us. Let's just touch the hem of your garment. Why? They saw the woman with the issue of blood touch the hem of his garment. In other words, the cloth that Jesus wore became a Power cloth. Why? Because he was anointed. And so the hem of his garment healed the, the, the people. Now we also see Paul in the use of aprons and handkerchiefs. Acts chapter 19 verse 12. The Bible says, and from the body of Paul were brought, so from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchief or aprons and the, and the diseases departed from them and evil spirits were cast out by aprons and handkerchief. We also see Paul in raising Eticus in a uh, Acts chapter 20, verse 10. What did he do? He stretched himself on the boy. And as he stretched himself on that boy, you remember the story? The boy, he was preaching overnight. And the boy sat on the third floor and fell down from the third floor dead. But Paul went there and said, don't worry, his spirit is still inside him. Stretched himself over him and the boy came back. Why? His body was anointed. So this morning, there is an impartation that is coming upon you. That will make the clothes you are wearing that will make your body imparted, that people will beg him, let me just touch your clothes. And as they touch your clothes, the power of God will be communicated in the name of Jesus Christ. We also saw Peter's shadow 
In Acts chapter 5, verse 15, Peter was just passing by and his shadow was just healing the sick. Acts chapter 5, verse 15. That's an impartation. Another impartation that I see in scripture is a supernatural process of using what we have to get what we need. That is point of contact, which we have been asked to to bring. Now, Jesus in feeding the four, five, and seven thousand asked the questions from his disciple. What do you have? In other words, there is something in your hand now that I want to use to take you to where I expect you to be. So the two fish and, and, and five loaves of bread and the, the, the three fish and four loaves of bread at another point did what? Did all of this multiplication through the point of contact. I also found in scripture that Elijah was on Mount Camel and calling down rain. And as he was calling down rain, he was telling his servant, go and check, number one. Go and check, number two. And on the seventh time, he said, I see a cloud like the hand of a man. It looks small, but the moment he saw it, that small hand of a man was what brought the big rain that they had. So sometimes, that small thing that is in your hand, you despise it, you call it small, but that is what God wants to use. That thing you have brought here as a material to be imparted upon today. As you go from here and take it up and move out, God will be giving you the great story and the big testimonies in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, the imparted material from God's anointed will only work when there is a spiritual connection with the God of that impata. Understand clearly. Gehazi had no connection with the God of Elisha. And so the rod of Elisha in his hand did not work. And he came back and said, Master, it worketh not. How will it work? You are a thief. You are a, you are a greedy man. You, you are not following your master. So because there was no connection, it couldn't work. And also remember in uh, Psalm 133, it said, How good and how blessed is it for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's like the ointing upon the head of Aaron that flows through his beard and through the skirt of his garment. So the anointing flows from the head, flows through every part of your body, even onto the materials that you wear. And that's what God will be doing for someone in this service in the name of Jesus Christ. I remember the testimony of one person one time. I asked him, why is your friend? He said, he's sick. And I said by the spirit of the Lord, give me your hand. I shook his hand. And I said, don't touch anyone as you go from here. Just go straight to your friend and lay their hands upon him. And as he went, he said, Pastor, I didn't, people were trying to shake me. I said, no, 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 no. I, I, I hit the hand. And he went right to the friend. He said, Pastor said, I should lay these hands on you. And as he laid their hands, it was like instant miracle. He said, he got up in his testimony. He got up from his bed and said, what happened? He said, Pastor said, I should lay hands. And as that hand came on him, life entered back into him. This morning, by the reason of the impartation that is coming upon your body, you shall be a savior from this mountain. The sick shall be healed in your hands. In the name of Jesus Christ. I also remember the testimony of one of us. And she said, Pastor, I love that company. I really want to work there. They've given me some time. I said, okay, get me a material from that company. She brought her fob key. And as she brought her fob key, I laid hands on it. And I said, in the name of Jesus, no man will say to you in that company, get out of this place. She still has the job to today. I remember the story of another one who said, Look, Pastor, I love to work in that company. I said, go to that company and get me something from that company. He went to the company. He went to the front desk. You know how they lay cards upon the front desk. He picked the card, all that he can pack from the table. He packed it and brought it. The moment he brought it and I imparted upon it. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I create a connectivity between you and the company. By the following week, they called him. They interviewed him and they gave him that job. That's why I'm confident this morning that the God who has called this impartation service is right here and is going to be imparting you. Shall we rise to our feet this morning?